going to situate my talk in two kinds of contexts. That's how I'm going to begin. The first kind of context is the study of legal English as in the wider academic discipline of language and law. So um, this is an area of interest for me. And this is actually, um, so legal English is only one intersection between where lawyers and linguists might work together. There are actually other areas that I'd like to very briefly mention, um, including areas such as forensic linguistics, so how linguists have been involved in assisting with criminal investigations, studying things like suicide notes, um, bomb threats, um, analyzing discourses to determine whether someone really made a threat, um, issues like that. Um, I mean, language of the law, legal language, they are more similar. And then other kinds of uh, language issues in law, such as access to justice, when you have children, second language speakers, and other vulnerable witnesses speaking in a courtroom, what kinds of linguistic accommodation needs to be made to them, um, language subject to law, so um, regulation of language, and other wider issues um, uh, that I would just call law, language, and society. So these are just kind of wider like, academic contexts in which this, I think, legal English um, topic um, is situated. A second kind of context, um, I feel obliged to talk about it uh, more today because I'm the only local person speaking today, and I want to say a bit more about the Hong Kong context. Um, referring back to the theme of the symposium, learning the language of the law, I want to begin by saying that um, there is actually more than one language of the law in Hong Kong, that Hong Kong is a bilingual legal system, that um, if you look at the basic law, which is the meaning constitution in Hong Kong, the Chinese is actually the authentic version of the law. Um, English is equally authentic, but where there is dispute, the Chinese prevails. When it comes to statutory law, Chinese and English texts of the law are equally authentic. This is provided and in various ordinances. It's also constitutionally recognized in the Article 9 of the Basic Law. I won't go through details. I just want to highlight the fact that there are actually languages of the law that students have to learn in Hong Kong. Um, very briefly, highlighting um, equal authenticity principle, um, which basically means that both English and, and Chinese texts of the law are, are authoritative that you should be able to depend on the Chinese text of the law um, in litigation in Hong Kong. So according to government papers, you should not treat the Chinese text as being subordinate to or me translation of its English counterpart. Um, this is not a principle invented in Hong Kong. This is actually taken from international law, uh, the equal authenticity principle, and it's also practiced in the EU where there are 24 official languages and also in Canada where English and French are official languages. Um, I just wanted to highlight this context because when you're practicing law in Hong Kong, um, I know that the focus today is mostly on the English, but the Chinese text may actually come up. How is this relevant um, to our discussion today? Um, firstly, interpretation issue. So if you have an equal authenticity principle, um, it's possible that you, the person that you're litigating against can be reading a different text than what you're reading. Another thing is, has to do with the medium of courtroom discourse, especially um, if you're involved in local practice. Most cases in lower courts in Hong Kong are actually tried in Chinese instead of English. Um, chances are that if you're practicing criminal law in Hong Kong, you have to um, at least be able to practice in Chinese. A related phenomenon that I've looked into in a government funded project is that there is a huge increase in unrepresented litigation in Hong Kong since the handover. And the large majority of unrepresented litigants in Hong Kong litigate in Cantonese. So if, if you are learning um, legal English as a student in Hong Kong, chances are that in a moot court like this, you'll be learning to argue against another person who's being trained in the law. But in practice in Hong Kong, chances are that when you, when you go to a lower court, you might be arguing against someone who's not trained in law. So it's not just a question of whether you can explain a legal idea to your mother or to your wife, this is why it's always women. Um, but, also <laughs> <laughs> but also, if you are in a courtroom litigating against someone who's like your mother and your wife, that you may be making, actually have to be arguing against them. And I'll give you some examples from ethnographic work um, in a bit. Um, even in private practice, um, so I, I, I direct a, a double degree program in uh, the University of Hong Kong in 
law and literary studies in the opening um, when I was preparing for um, some information session I was talking to a lawyer friend who's um, in corporate law in Hong Kong I was asking her if you were if there's, if there's one thing you want to say to my future law students in Hong Kong what is it like what should be how should they prepare themselves um, to become a good lawyer in Hong Kong the one thing she said is learn Mandarin um, so I just wanted to highlight the fact that there are all these um, other kind of um, linguistic dimensions to legal practices in Hong Kong and I'll, I'm coming to um, legal English so um, I think it's important to clarify what we mean by legal English um, some of the talks some of the videos and some of the points about plain language um, you know in a way we can be talking about the same kinds of issues anywhere it could be Australia it can be UK it can be the US um, so legal English means slightly different things in different jurisdictions and at different points in time um, I think just now the Dean of um, City U um, has mentioned that you know, there are differences, say, in vocabulary between American legal English versus British uh, kind of English kind of common law language, um, and also different points in time. So as lawyers, I mean, perhaps less, less so in, in the corporate world, but then if you're, say, when you're reading legislation that were written 100 years ago, you're reading kind of quite different kind of legal language. And, and the point that you mentioned was that um, in Hong Kong, we actually retain quite a lot of archaic legal English. So there are kind of peculiarities about legal English used in Hong Kong. There's something about post-colonial jurisdictions, the way they act like a time capsule in terms of retaining features that um, perhaps in, in the UK they no longer retain. In the UK, they got rid of wearing wigs um, in, in, in the courtroom, but here we, we want to retain that tradition. So kind of local nuances. nuances. I want to also emphasize the fact that legal English involves both comprehension and production. I think that most of the discussion we've had so far emphasized on production, so how students can write better, how they can talk better. But echoing what I think Christopher was just saying, you also have to take into account input. What have the students been reading? What ha how, did, how, how good are they in understanding legal texts? So I think there's more, more emphasis should be given to questions of comprehension. I'll give you more examples of that in a bit. And legal English involves both spoken and written aspects. Um, I think in the second panel, we're going to move on to more spoken issues. I'll also include one or two examples in my talk. And lastly, I want to highlight the fact that legal English may be read by both legal professionals and laypersons. And um, from my ethnographic work, um, I'll show you that um, unrepresented litigants have attempted to read legal texts on their own without assistance and what happens um, in those situations. So because I'm, I want to emphasize um, comprehension as an important dimension of legal understanding or learning legal English, I'm going to start with a little bit of history. There are distinctive features such as the ones that uh, Richard was talking about in modern legal English that actually these are not just random stylistic features that lawyers like and put in the law but they're there because of social linguistic complexities in different historical periods. Uh, one example that you have raised was um, say cease and desist like this kind of um, pairs of words nouns uh, or verbs that we like to use together they tend to reflect a historical uh, a fact which was trilingualism in the, in the English common law system after the Norman conquest. So um, between English, French and Latin. You will see also a lot of alliteration. So for example, to have and to hold uh, in marriage. This is used for memory aid because in the English common law used to have an oral culture instead of, which is very different from the current written culture that we're, we're accustomed to. So they, they all have their historical origins, and if you appreciate their historical origins, you appreciate the text that you're reading much better. I want to bring in a bit of the Hong Kong context here. So if you consider such pairs of words, if you, which have their historical you know, origins, so one word may be reflecting the French origin, another word might be reflecting the Anglo-Saxon origin. What happens when you have to translate these terms? So, um, one example I have, these are all taken from the DOJ's um, bilingual glossary, which is freely available online. Um, there is not a lot of consistency in how these are translated. So in the first example, you don't have to understand Chinese in order to appreciate my point. For the first example, you have a pair of verbs. And in the Chinese version, 
you, you have retained that structure, you have another pair of verbs. And the second example, you have um, now in void, and in Hong Kong, it's a much simplified um, translation instead of corresponding to the English structure. And if you consider, if, you have, if for any reason you have to do any back translation, chances are that you're not going to translate back into this English, original English structure. So there's a lot of complexities involved um, in legal translation issues um, because of the complexities of legal English. And you have to have an appreciation of its history in order to, see, to understand its complexities. A highlight, um, I won't go into details, but um, a lot of these features of legal language we can describe as legal register. Um, so from, from things like, like layout to questions of grammar to lexis, a lot of which was highlighted in the last talk, um, these are the kinds of things that, that actually laymen can pick up. So from my um, ethnographic work, um, I've seen one very sophisticated and very well-educated unrepresented litigant because she has been, she pursued at least three cases um, 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 in Hong Kong courts. If you just take a short segment of what she says in the courtroom and she litigated in English, you would almost think that she's a lawyer if, because through the course of her experience as a litigant, she picked up a lot of these things like grammar and vocabulary. But what she does not pick up is genre features. So genre features have to do with um, kind of functional aspects of text. So she, or even though she was talking like a lawyer, because she has some of the vocabulary and formality and all that, she misses some of the important functional aspects of legal language. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to repeat um, details of um, genre discussions, because I think um, the other two speakers said quite a lot about it. Um, just wanted to highlight very quickly the fact that these genre markers the way they're different from register, what we talked about in the last slide, is that genre markers are structural features. That if you miss one genre marker, the, the whole text can fall apart. That's a major difference between legal register and legal gen genre. With register, if you remove one formal, formalistic feature, you still have a legal text. So when we talk about simplifying legal English, we're talking about register features. But genre features are completely different things. Um, I'll give you one example from uh, a case study. This is um, a litigant who is, again, very well educated um, in Canada, actually, so bilingual person. Cantonese is his first uh, language. When asked how he attempted to understand legal language, he says, from my personal experience, I mostly guess. So that's what layman's you know, attempt to do. I do want to say that the government, because there are now a lot of unrepresented litigants, so in 2003, the government set up a resource center for unrepresented litigants. And I have a PhD student whose who's PhD basically focused on what this um, resource center offered, the whole experience. He was interviewing unrepresented litigants, he was doing ethnographic work in a courtroom. Um, one finding that he has from the materials, the resources the government offered was that those resources are utterly incomprehensible to the layperson. And these are resources that are directed for laypersons. I've, I've read some of these texts. I, I have you know, multiple degrees in language. I cannot understand what they say. Um, one example, if you understand Chinese, is the term tickling, which um, uh, we looked up the modern Chinese corpora. It's not in a modern Chinese vocabulary. They, in the course of translation, uh, for some reason, they coined a term, they picked a term from Asian Chinese and, and, and use it in, in modern Chinese texts. And, and there's just no way an average person can understand this. But this kind of guessing does not always work. One example that the litigant uh, told us about was counsel certificate. Um, when he came across this term, his guess was that, okay, this must be some kind of license that the barrister has. And then, but it doesn't make sense because, of course, he would have to have a license in order to become a barrister. So he couldn't make sense of what's going on. And it turns out that it's something entirely different than what he had imagined. It's some, something the court has to grant um, to, for counsel to be representing um, um, someone in a lower court in order to control um, um, kind of imbalances in, of power. One other example that he raised, and this is actually the, um, the crucial ordinance for the case that he was litigating in, um, he was basically suing a club, um, um, which he was a member of. So he stopped paying membership fee for a while, and then that club charged him compound interest um, for, for the money that he owed the club. So he was relying on mostly Section 22 um, 
um, of the uh, money lender ordinance, where this applies only to a money lender. So I've highlighted it in italics in, in that section. But he was also pointing to the fact that, no, I read the whole ordinance. Uh, so chapter 163, more than half of the ordinance says anyone, any person. So this whole ordinance must apply to anyone, any person. And the court just told him, wait, no, but this section that you rely on only talks about money lenders. So he, I think this is a, a question of understanding of genre. So what this, um, how functionally this ordinance works. Okay, oops. Right, so, um, oops. Um, very briefly move on to um, spoken issues of spoken um, um, interactions in courtroom. So Haven 2005 um, posted that in courtroom, courtroom interaction is, has, actually contains more than one genre. So it has a paradigmatic mode of uh, speaking, so similar to what is taught in law school, kind of um, legal reasoning, uh, rational kind of discussion. There is also one other very important element, which is narrative. So in opening statement, closing statements, even within like summing up, ju judicial summing up, there is um, narrativ narrativization of, of storytelling. And these don't come from nowhere. It goes back to what I was saying about comprehension or input, that what students get as input. So what I do at the University of Hong Kong is because I run a double degree program in law and literary studies, Students not only study law, they actually have to read literature, they have to read stories. I think in order to become, become good storytellers, you have to read stories to start with. Um, legal aid discourse in Hong Kong <coughs> is a bit more complicated than what um, Hever describes. So these are kind of generic features that, um, that applies to almost any, any common law courtroom. So you have um, Councils talking to you know, jurors um, and to witnesses, but on the other hand, their main target audience is, ju is jurors. So there's kind of multi-dimensionality in, in courtroom interactions. I won't go over these details, um, but just to give you an example of the additional layers of complexity um, of Hong Kong courtrooms, you have litigants who don't play by the rules and you have to learn how to deal with them. Um, one example that I have obtained from my own ethnographic work is I had, have heard a litigant who used objection as a means of conveying disagreement. I disagree with what you say and therefore I, sh I shout objection. Now this is something they pick up probably from television. So you know, they, get, they see that people can raise objections at some point but they don't understand the rules that govern um, when you're supposed to object. So, and, and this is not the kind of thing that uh, the law students are, are trained to deal with, but it's happening in Hong Kong courtrooms every day. So I think this just calls for kind of greater need to understand what's going on in courtrooms right now in Hong Kong. Um, I will end my talk by um, highlighting the, the, the necessity for interdisciplinary knowledge. So, I, I mentioned that in my double degree program, there is the literature component, but here I want to focus on the more linguistic kind of component. Um, for example, I think it's really important for students to um, develop sensitivity towards various kinds of linguistic indeterminacies. So this goes back to um, what people were saying about precision. But in order to write precisely, you have to understand where imprecision comes from. And this is the kind of thing that linguists do. So we highlight you know, where vagueness comes from, how words are different, what kinds of ambiguity may exist. Ambiguity may come from a word, it may come from structures, it might come from how you put words together. So all these intricacies like punctuations, lists and connectives, etc. This is the kind of thing that we teach in a double degree program. The second point seems to be, you know, I don't know, it may seem really obvious to you, but let's look at this one particular example. This text is taken from a recent uh, US Supreme Court judgment. Um, here, uh, the court needs to decide whether carries a firearm is limited to the carrying of firearms on the person. So in the case, the firearm was in the car uh, trunk. Now this is an ordinary word, so they're not looking for technical legal meaning. So what the court did was, okay, let's look up some dictionaries and see what they say about the word carry. 
Um, consider the word's primary meaning. The Oxford English Dictionary gives as its first definition, convey da 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 da. Does that read good to you? So you look up a dictionary, like Oxford English Dictionary is an authoritative dictionary, we know that. It's good reputation, so we look it up and we find the first meaning. As is ordinary meaning, does that sound good to you? Yeah. Except that, do you know what the Oxford English Dictionary is about? Um, this is from the Oxford English Dictionary website. So what are the differences between the OED and the Oxford Dictionaries? I'll just skip to the important part. The OED, on the other hand, is the historical dictionary, and it forms a record of all the core words and meanings in English for over a thousand years, from Old English to the present day, da 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 da. Meanings are ordered chronologically in the OED. Meaning the judges did not know fully the tools they were using, even though you know, it's the primary resource that they draw on when they try to understand legal meaning. So, okay, skipping to the second kind of tool, I don't know whether most of you might have heard of corpus. It's a very simple idea. You can see Google as a corpus, like so a body of text, and then you can use this tool to, to help you understand how meaning uh, how, what a word means, for example. And it's quite common these days for courts to just look up, say, Google News or, um, Lexis, uh, or, or kind of various kinds of online databases for them to see how a word is used in certain contexts. Um, this is, uh, on, on the slide, there are two examples of, uh, in the same, from the same case where the uh, judges were trying to do that. In the first example, they were looking at, okay, in order to show that this meaning of a word um, it's valid, it says, okay, greatest, the great writers have written this word and they use this to, re to refer to this particular sense. So first example was the King James Bible. Anything odd about that? Obviously, that was a piece of translation. It's not original. I don't know whether that should change your judgment as to how, you know, how persuasive um, this example is. Second, a more general point is, if you want to show what a word means in a particular context, does it do anything to just draw from examples of, yeah, the great writers have written this word and use it to refer to a particular sense? Is that good evidence for the meaning of a word in a particular context? That's the question I wanted to ask. Um, same, this is from the same case where the, the court um, looks at New York Times database and, and look up the meaning of words in these databases. All I wanted to highlight is that there are better tools that linguists have come up with for such tasks that eliminate some of the biases you might have by just doing a Google search. Now, a Google search contains um, results that are organized not just by frequency, there are other considerations um, that Google has when it organizes results, um, commercial considerations. There are questions of replicability, because when you have, if you use Google or Google News as a database, um, if you do a search today versus if you do a search 30 days later, you may get slightly different results. So there are tools um, called Corpus or Corpus Linguistics that people have come up with where you can have access to um, language data that's cleaned up it's organized purely based on frequency, that um, it's not tamed by commercial considerations, and that um, you can have replicable results when you do such searches. I think I have to stop there. I'm already over time, but um, this is what I wanted to highlight, that um, it's important to understand the local context when we talk about legal English, especially the case of legal bilingualism in Hong Kong. I'm shocked, shocked that um, in Legal education in Hong Kong, say, in my university, students can go through the whole legal education curriculum without knowing anything about legal bilingualism. There is one optional use of Chinese in a legal context course that they can take if they want to. Otherwise, they don't have to do anything um, about that. And secondly, importance of interdisciplinary knowledge. And I'll just um, say that uh, most of the materials that I presented today come from this book, and I have it with me. If you're interested to take a look during the coffee break, you're most welcome to. Thank you very much.